If you are online, we want to welcome you, say thank you very much for joining us, whether you're online live or you're watching this later. Um, oh, how do you like that? No, thank you. There we go. All right. It's always, it's always iffy when you turn the computer on and it doesn't do what you think it's supposed to. So um, if you're online, it's good to have you. Glad you're with us. Please uh, let us know uh, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. Just uh, YouTube, you can't leave a comment, but, uh, you know, give give a thumbs up or something later on. Um, but for Facebook people, let us know you're here. We'd love to, to hear from you, and, and we are praying for you that God would speak to you through this this morning. We have been, if you're here for the first time, we've been going through uh, a, a study on the Holy Spirit. Who is He? And, and what does He do? And why is there a Holy Spirit? And so what, some of the things we have learned is that He is God, he dwells within us, and He is seeking to transform us by the fruit of the Spirit. Um, I, and I say seeking to because, as most of you know, at any, at any moment, we can say, hmm, Jesus, Holy Spirit, no thank you. I don't want to be patient today. I don't want to have self-control. Um, but what is true is that He is seeking to make us more like Jesus by transforming us, by producing the fruit of the Spirit in us. And now, He also desires to give gifts, because God is a gift-giving God. And so um, the Holy Spirit gives gifts, hands out gifts at various times, and we've talked about what those are. Uh, we have talked about, um, we, we've actually looked at the whole list, and to the best of our ability, we, we have seen that there's 21 gifts that Paul lists, but there's actually can be many more than that as the Holy Spirit enables different people. And so over the next week or two, we're going to be talking about some specific supernatural giftings that God gives out. Uh, last week, we talked about the gift of tongues, uh, which we discovered was not just uh, some language that nobody can understand, but can be a miraculous ability to speak a language people can understand when needed. It can be used by God to provide an opportunity to pray when you don't know what to pray. And sometimes it can be used as a form of uh, a message, when it's interpreted by somebody, it can be used as a miraculous opportunity to speak to people who don't know Jesus and, and amaze them and say, oh, God is here. So um, <coughs> today, we're going to be talking about healing and the gifts of healing. But before we do that, I want to remind us of something, and that is this. Based on Jesus and Paul's words about last... Um, about the Holy Spirit, I want us to remember this statement. And not just about the Holy Spirit, but about life in general. I want us to remember this statement. As we talk about the different supernatural gifts, we are asking God to pour them out on us in order to enjoy and practice the fullness of God. That is all that He wants to give us. In order to love Him and love people so that they may experience that same fullness of God. We also want to make sure we understand the proper use of those gifts so we don't fall into the same trap that the Corinthians did. Paul wrote a couple of very strong letters to them about their use of spiritual gifts. And he, he, it, wasn't, it wasn't being done well, and he wanted to bring correction. So we want to learn from the Corinthians and use the gifts that he gives us well. Okay, <coughs> so with that in mind, let's pray. And then um, I've got something for you all. Jesus, I thank you that you are here and that you have come and, and joined us, God. Holy Spirit, would you please anoint me to teach, gift me to teach and preach, and would you speak truth to your people this morning? I pray that we would be ready, ready and willing to receive what you have for us and be obedient in how we use it and in using it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. Those of you who are online, I apologize in advance. You're not going to be able to hear the next couple of minutes, but bear with me. Hang in there. It'll come back. All right. Now, I want to hear, and I posted this on Facebook, so some of you may even be prepared. I want to hear your favorite story in the New Testament of a healing that occurred. And I don't care why it's your favorite, but, but keep it short, just, you know, short things. But I want to hear your favorite story. So somebody, let's go two or three people, um, yes, Cecilia, right? Yeah. 
Uh-huh. Right. Yep. 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 That was Acts chapter two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there a favorite story of a healing that takes place? <laughs> right. Yeah. He definitely comes through and 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 uses them and yeah. Okay. All right. Somebody else. Which one? And who? <laughs> I mean, I mean, who who healed him? Okay, Jesus healed the leper. There were a couple of them. Which one was your favorite? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Yes. Well, that's yeah, yeah. When he resurrected somebody, he did that a couple of times. You remember? Oh, Lazarus, yeah. Actually, it was four days. Four days, yeah. One of my favorite songs is, um, is, the, is when, I think it was, not Don Francisco, Carmen talking, uh, sings a song, and he talks about that, and he says, um, he's talking about Jesus rising from the dead, and he's saying to the grave, hey, grave, are you, you got this? Because um, I'm kind of concerned, because you thought you had Lazarus for four days. And, and Laz- Jesus called him back. And Jesus said he's only going to be there for three. So, Grave, you got this? And maybe he had to have been there. Anyway, any other? One more. Uh, Daryl. Yes. Yeah. That one's a good one. Come on. You guys, leave this place alone. I, I, she is just sleeping, and everybody laughs at him, mocks at him, and he sends them out, and then he goes and, and raises her from the dead. So, yeah, that is, is definitely one of my favorites. All right, now, I got another one for you. I am a little hot. Can you, I, I'm, when I'm loud for me, when I'm, I'm too loud. Um, <laughs> has anybody encountered an opportunity where you have either seen or been healed, or you have been the person praying and somebody's been healed as you have laid hands on them (sighs) yes ma'am your youth pastor did yeah seal up. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Dad. Totally disrupted the service. Praise God. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Praise God. That's awesome. Your godmother? Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay. So one of the things that is true about, one of the things that's true about the Foursquare movement, but about most Christians in general, is we believe that God heals. Jesus is the healer. There we go. Um, we believe Jesus heals, that he's, it's not just for back in the Bible, that he does it now. So we're going to talk about what the Bible has to say about healing because he still does what he did back then. So we're going to start clear back in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. It says, Moses is talking to the Israelites. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. And this is the important part I want for you. 
For I am the Lord who heals you. In Hebrew, he is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals you. That is his name. And in Hebrew, and in, uh, even in New Testament times, names meant something. Names were not just given out because they needed a uh, Paul, Jim, Fred. They just needed to, to label them. Names meant something. And when God says, I am Jehovah Rapha, he is saying, that is, a, that is my character. That is my identity, or at least a part of it. As you go through the Old Testament, he gives other names for himself. But that is, that is one of them. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals you. That is who he is. In the New Testament, Jesus was the one who said, I am, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The whole idea is that Jesus, what Jesus was doing was God's character. He was showing God's character for people. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus says that the kingdom of God is about healing and deliverance. Chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. In Matthew chapter 8, when he, evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. You see, that's who Jesus was. That was his character. And then he, he didn't just, just do it himself. Then he handed to the disciples, he, actually 72 disciples, not just the 12, although he did it to, for the 12 earlier, but to the disciples, 72 of them. He said, look, it's not just about me. I give you authority and power also. You go do the same. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. The kingdom of God that Jesus brought, the kingdom of God is about, in part, the healing of the nations. Physical, spiritual, everything. God, the Bible says Jesus came to bring life. Not just, not just to bring salvation, he came to bring life to the fullest. And then, when Jesus was about ready to go back to the Father after he's raised from the dead, he doesn't just say good luck, but he says this in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. We're familiar with that part. Okay. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. Jesus was saying that would be our role as well, to bring life to others. Place our hands on the sick and those, they will get well. <coughs> then Paul continues that vein. He says in chapter thir of uh, excuse me, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, he says, "Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. God has placed in the church first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues." Hebrews 13:8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to get across in just these few verses, and I, we could be here for a little bit longer if you'd like, and I could show you other verses, that Jesus came to empower us through the Holy Spirit so that we can bring healing to people. So why don't we see it? Why don't we see more healings? If that's what our, part of our role, if we're supposed to bring the kingdom of God into this world and part of that is healing, 
Why don't we see it? Scripture seems to indicate a few things that keep people from being healed. Now, as I list things, people like to make lists and say, okay, check, 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 check. Okay. Ultimately, we need to know this is, we are not the power. God is the power moving through us, and we have to let him be God. But that being said, sometimes there are things that, that break, break it up and say, not, that's not going to happen right now. And the first thing is sin, either in the person being healed or the person praying. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 29 through 30 is an example of, of Paul explaining, you know what, when there's sin in your life, God, God won't necessarily move. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup, and he's talking about the communion elements, okay, if you do that without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. Some of you may remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Okay, they sold some property and said, here is all the money we made off of it, when in reality they were holding a portion of it back. And Peter said, this isn't going to end well for you. You have lied to the Holy Spirit, and they died. Now, you can certainly feel free to question God and say, hey, was that really fair? That's between God and them. My point is that sometimes our sin keeps God from healing, either us or somebody else. <clears throat> Another thing that it can be is a lack of faith. And I'll get to the, the opposite of that in a minute, but sometimes... Jesus says that sometimes a lack of faith will keep him from being able to do any miracles. Jesus then returned from to Nazareth, his hometown, in Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 54. Jesus then returned to Nazareth, his hometown. When he taught there in the synagogue, everyone was amazed and said, where does he get this wisdom and the power to do miracles? Then they scoffed. Wait a minute. He is just a carpenter's son. Yes, I added a few words. And we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers. James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, all his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? And they were deeply offended at and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his own family. And so he did only a few miracles there because of their unbelief. So yeah, unbelief, lack of faith, that can cause healing not to take place or any other miracles for that matter. Another reason that when you pray for people, healing might not occur is timing. Sometimes the timing is not way, the way God wants it to be. We live in a world at war, and so sometimes also the timing takes longer because we have to fight for the miracle. So either because of the battle taking longer or because God's saying, nope, I've got a plan for this, sometimes timing will do it. Mark chapter 9, verse 28 through 29 is an example of the battle occurring. And when he had come into the house, well, let me back up. So this is after Jesus had cast a demon out of a little boy. You may recall the story because this is where the, the father, Jesus sa father says, if you can deliver my boy. And Jesus says, if? And, and the father says, I believe, help my unbelief. Okay, some of you may have heard that story. That was the father's response. And Jesus is like, it's okay, I got this. And then he, he heals the boy, delivers the de casts the demon out, and the boy is, is delivered completely. But before that even, the disciples had been trying. Jesus wasn't there for a while. He was up on a mountain with Peter, James, and John. And the rest of the disciples, Andrew and, um, <coughs> excuse me, Andrew and Judas and some of the other guys, they're sitting there, and they're like, why, why couldn't we have healed him, Jesus? What, we tried. Why didn't, why didn't? And Jesus says, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Or some of your Bibles may just say, but uh, come out by nothing but prayer. Which is to say, sometimes it's a battle. Sometimes you have to fight a battle to get things to happen. Jesus was just prayed up, and they weren't. All right. Uh, then in Acts chapter 3, talking about timing, Acts chapter 3, there's this lame beggar. 
And Acts chapter 3, verse 2 explains to us that this lame beggar had been lame from birth and had been begging for as long as people could remember. Every day, somebody brought him to that street, that place, on the way to the temple, so that he could beg for alms, for, for money, from the people going to the temple. He'd been doing it for years. And by years, I mean like he was there when Jesus was. And Jesus went often to the temple in Jerusalem. And yet, Jesus would have passed him by and not healed him. Timing. Because somehow, in God's order, God knew that Peter needed to bring healing to this man so that God's name would be glorified and Peter would have the opportunity to share the gospel. I encourage you to read the story in Acts chapter 3. But my point being is timing. Sometimes God doesn't heal because the time's not right or because it takes a long time to fight the fight. Okay? Another, a fourth reason that we don't see healing. God may be trying to teach the person praying or God may be trying to teach the sick person something. This story in Ch John chapter 9 is a good example of that. Jesus was walking along. He saw a man born uh, he, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. And his disciples said to him, Hey, Rabbi, why is this man blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Now, mind you, he'd been blind from birth. So the first thing that occurs to me that as they're asking this question, as I'm reading this, I'm going, how could he have sinned before he was born? That's not fair. That is not a nice question. His parents maybe, but not him. Anyway, Jesus puts all that aside. Um, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Sometimes we have to wait for the timing so that somebody's lesson can be learned. Then, he, then Jesus went and spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go, wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. And amazingly enough, that wasn't necessarily a lesson for the man. It was for the disciples. God wanted the disciples and those around him to see the healing. Finally, sometimes we just don't know. As I said, God's God. And he heals in his timing or he doesn't heal. A couple examples of this, Paul's uh, that Paul lists, Paul talks about. Galatians chapter 4, verses 13 through 14, we have an example of this, where God allowed Paul, or caused Paul, or whatever, I, it depends on your theology, I tend to lean on he allowed Paul to get sick. Verse 13 of chapter 4, Paul's saying to the Galatians, as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Because of Paul's sickness, Paul got the opportunity to share the gospel with the Galatians. doesn't say anything about the fact that, that God healed, or about the idea that God healed him, the belief that God... No, Paul, Paul got sick, and he, that sickness was a trial to the Galatians. But because of that trial, the Galatians were introduced to the gospel. Philippians chapter 2, Paul tells it of another time where somebody else was sick. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. All of that is explaining to, who, to us who Epaphroditus is. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Now, is it possible that God did heal miraculously Epaphroditus? Yes, but notice that he allowed Epaphroditus to get near to death before he healed him. Doesn't say why. Just says he did. Sometimes God just lets sickness go for a specific reason. Those are just some of the reasons. We don't know all the reasons. Ultimately, God is still God. And what is especially true is that no matter whether the sickness leads to death or it leads to life, what is true is two things. Number one, God is good. 
And number two, God still calls us to believe and trust that and pray that he would bring life into that situation. Everywhere you look in the Gospels and Acts, there was times when God may not have healed, but there was never a place where they didn't expect him to. If the people prayed, they expected Jesus or God or whomever, depending on who it was, to, to, to heal. Jesus never looked up to the Father and said, God, if it's your will, could you please heal him? You never hear that from Peter either. It was always the expectation. So let's look at how they could expect that. Or maybe a better way of putting it is, how can we do our part? What is our part to facilitate the healing of, the, of people? Because we do have a part to play. We are not the healer, but we, God in His grace invites us along and says, I want to work through you. So, first thing we can do, we pray for the gifts of healing. That's, that's an easy one. God, please grant us the gifts of healing, that people would be healed as I lay hands on them, as I anoint them with oil, as I pray for them. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, pursue and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Earnestly desire them, pursue them, ask for them. It's not wrong. Jesus said, oh, sorry, we must put our faith in Jesus and his ability and desire to heal. As we were talking to Chris about this this morning, there's nothing magical about the oil. That was pretty good, huh? Nothing magical about the oil, okay? There's nothing magical about me laying my hands on somebody. That, th there's no power in that apart from the power of God. It's all about Jesus. These are simply things that Jesus uses, tools for various and sundry reasons that Jesus uses to bring healing. But Jesus is the one. So we put our faith, not in our faith, not in the oil, but in Jesus. Jesus said something similar to the lady with the issue of blood. Mark chapter 5, verse 34. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. And if you want a great picture of that, there is, the Chosen has a fantastic uh, uh, portrayal of that. Season 3, episode 8 or 9, something like that. Great portrayal. Okay? Your faith has made you well. Not... Not that you touched the right parts of my garment, because that was what she was going for, but that her faith in him made her well. Luke said something similar about a man with crippled feet in Lystra. So Luke is writing the book of Acts, and he's talking about how Paul was preaching in this, this town of Lystra. And this is what he says in chapter 14. While they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Just sitting there, listening. Paul was preaching. This is a Gentile. This is a man who had, did not have the Bible or the Old Testament. All, in fact, he probably only had the Greek gods as his backdrop. But this is what happened. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Looking straight at him, Paul realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called to him in a loud voice, stand up! And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? All of a sudden, you, you, this, this stranger says to you, stand up! The guy must have had faith because he didn't look at Paul like Paul was nuts and say, can you not see? Okay? But he stood up because he believed he had faith in the God that Paul was talking about. In addition to having faith, James lists a few other things. The book of James, chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. James says this. He says, Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the, in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. <clears throat> There's several things in there that James is saying that, that apply to healing. Number one is repentance. 
We already talked about that. If there's sin in your life, you've got to be ready to repent. Whether you're the prayer or the prayee, the healer or the healee, you've got to be willing to repent. You've got to be willing to say, God, there is sin in my life and I'm sorry. Now, your sin may be the thing that caused the sickness, or the sickness may just be caused by the fact we live in a fallen world, but if there's sin in your life and you repent, James says that's part of the healing process. James indicates that one of the tools that God gives us is, is oil, anointing with oil. Now, some of that <coughs> is that in their time, oil was a kind of like us using an antiseptic today. But some of it was that God, the, the oil was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And when we anoint people with oil, we are saying, God, like I'm pouring, putting this oil on them, may you pour your spirit out on them. <coughs> uh, no, he didn't say anything about blessed. He just says anoint them with oil. And then he says people praying for each other. He actually says, he says, um, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Yes, calling for the elders is part of that. If you're an elder in the church, that's yes. But you know what? Anybody, anybody, James says it, Jesus says it, anybody can pray for people and see them healed. And finally, God seems to put some importance on us laying hands on each other. I don't fully understand that part. Haven't studied it much. All I know is time and again, you see it in Acts, you see it in the Gospels, you see it in the Old Testament. People laying hands on each other um, and praying for each other and God using that, His power going through that person. Certainly there's the power of touch. That matters. The leper that was healed, I think it was the same leper that you were talking about, Donald. The leper that was healed, I'll tell you, it was definitely the power of God coming through Jesus, but that power of touch for a man who hadn't been touched in years because he was a leper, that in and of itself healed something inside of him, not just his leprosy. Laying on of hands. Some, the, so that's what James talks about. Repentance, anointing with oil, people praying for each other, laying on of hands. Worsh there's also some other things that seem to at least provide more opportunity. Worship and praise increases our faith. As we sing these songs to God, our faith is increased. And so faith being part of healing, worship and praise helps. It invites the Holy Spirit into the situation and puts our focus on the one who heals rather than on the sickness or even on our prayer warriors. Or our prayer, or even, yeah, rather... Sorry, what was I thinking when I wrote this? It puts our focus not, as we worship and praise, it puts our focus not on the sick person or on the person praying, but it puts our focus on him. Also, another aspect, as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, as we are praying in the Spirit, sometimes we simply need to stop and say, God, what are you wanting to do here? Remember what I said, sometimes there's stuff that's keeping a healing from occurring. And if we as prayer warriors, as we have people who are coming and praying for that person, if we will stop and listen, God may tell us, this is what you need to say to that person. This is, this is what needs to happen, whatever. Or this is how you need to pray. Because it's not their foot that's the problem. It's maybe it's a, a, a bad nerve or I don't know. But God knows. Or unforgiveness. If there's unforgiveness, God will definitely um, use that in your life, to use sickness to bring that attention to it. Sometimes we need to listen. And, and, and what helps is if we, uh, yes, last week we talked about praying in tongues. Sometimes praying in tongues and asking God for the interpretation will do just that. It will, uh, it will enable you and the person you're praying for to hear from the Lord, oh, this is what really needs to be done, dealt with. You need to forgive, or you need to um, do this, or this is, this is what needs to healed, actually. So sometimes praying in tongues, 
and asking for the interpretation. Uh, sometimes there's a spiritual attack or agreement that needs to be broken, and so we listen. God, what agreement has this person made with the enemy, consciously or unconsciously, that we need to break the power of the enemy in their life? All right, so lists, a lot of lists there. And again, my goal is not to say, here's your checklist, go through all of these things, and then that person will be healed. My goal is simply to say, sometimes these things need to be addressed, talked about. These are ways that we can help facilitate healing. But here's, Jesus made a big deal about faith, but here is the second thing that's probably the second most important thing to remember, and that is this. Don't quit. Don't quit quit praying for that person. Luke chapter 18, or for your own healing. Luke chapter 18, Jesus told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. There was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people, and a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he was unwilling but later he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because the widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. And Jesus used that parable to say, it's not because your father is an unjust judge, but even more, if that's what an unjust judge does, how much more will your father who wants to give life, who wants to bring healing, if you don't give up, keep praying, keep seeking him, keep fighting the spiritual battle that needs to be fought, and God will come through. As I said, Foursquare really believes that God heals, that Jesus is the healer. Here is the statement from Foursquare's statement of belief. We believe that divine healing is the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to heal the sick and afflicted in answer to believing prayer. That he who is the same yesterday, today, and forever has never changed, but is still an all-sufficient help in time of trouble, able to meet the needs of and quicken the body into newness of life, as well as the soul and spirit in answer to the faith of them who ever pray with submission to his divine sovereign will. There's always that part. We have to be submissive to him. My goal this morning is to increase your faith to believe that God not only wants to heal, but that he can heal through you. Not just heal you, but through you he can heal others. The person sitting next to you, some of you are going to be really up, up a creek because you have nobody sitting next. No, I'm just kidding. Okay? He can heal the person sitting next to you. He can heal anybody who has surrendered their life to Jesus and has the Holy Spirit of God living in them. He can work through any of you. Okay? The pastor does not have a hotline to God. All right? I am, my hands are not any more special than yours. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, then God can heal people through you. And he wants to. I want to end with one more story to help your faith, to encourage you that God wants to heal. This is a story by uh, Sharon Hlodek. If she ever sees this video, I hope she doesn't kill me for butchering her name. She's a four-square missionary in Cambodia. And this is her story. I was seven when I sensed God calling me to share his love with children throughout the wor world. As I sat on the altar steps at church listening to Tia Linda Ritchie share about what God was doing in and through the children of South America, I knew that God was calling me to care for orphans and widows. <coughs> Unfortunately, she had some health issues. At the time of my graduation from Life Pacific College, which is now Life Pacific University, when I should have been preparing to deploy to the mission field, I was instead diagnosed with a severe form of epilepsy. It affected every aspect of my life, as I would have up to 20 seizures a day. The doctors informed me that I would never again be able to travel overseas. So in September of 2015, and I've, I've condensed this story. There's a lot of details I'm leaving out just try and get through it before one. In September of 2015, I underwent surgery where the doctors removed several structures within my right temporal lobe. Though a success, there were complications that caused a stroke. I had to relearn basic functions such as how to walk, write, and how to care for myself. So that was September 2015. 
June 2018, I sensed the Lord calling me to return to Cambodia and serve the kids whom I had grown to love so deeply over the years. This was a huge step of faith, one that my medical team was at first hesitant to approve. Finally, in August of 2019, they approved my application to serve overseas. On September 14, 2019, I moved to Cambodia as a missionary with Foursquare Missions International, and my life would never be the same. When I arrived in Cambodia, I was using a crutch for balance and to assist in my walking. I had a scar from the surgery above my right ear. Other than that, from the outside, no one would have known the three-year journey of recovery that I had walked through. Three years, 2015 to 2018, or really 2019. Three years she had walked through this journey. Three years, and, and she still was using a crutch for balance because she couldn't walk on her own. Each day, the kids at, church, at the church home in Phnom Penh would pray for me, take my crutch, and encourage me to walk toward them. Witnessing their faith stirred something within me, and I began to see a deeper healing take place. She's 20-some years old, and these little kids, elementary age, are praying for her and saying, Now, we've prayed for you. Jesus is the healer. Give me your crutch. Now you walk. And each day she would try. But each day God was doing something in her. So in December 2019, three months after I arrived in Cambodia, one of our orphaned kids, Danny, who also walked with a limp at the time, took my crutch and asked me to walk with her. I was deeply moved as I saw this beautiful young lady who always wanted to walk without a limp encourage me to take a step of faith. As I walked toward her, it was a moment of elation and great celebration. From that moment on, I never used my crutch again. Today, I can say that God has healed me. I now walk without the use of my crutch. I can run and play with the orphaned kids I help care for, as well as perform the necessary functions of the ministry and help raise up the next generation of young leaders who will one day change their nation. It was through, that serving, it was through serving others that God released more of his healing power in my life. God's healing has shown the locals and the kids here just how strong their faith is and how he listens to the prayers of children. I've been able to minister to others in our church community who have physical needs. Because of my own journey, I, was a, I am able to identify with the physical and emotional needs of others. It has been a testimony to the power of prayer and faith that even when things seem impossible, God always has the final say. There is so much in that story I want you to see and to hear. First of all, the faith of a child. A child who also had been praying, God, heal me, and God hadn't done it yet. And yet that child prayed for her caretaker, her, that missionary, and God used that child to bring healing to the missionary. What's also true is, I guarantee you, that, that girl went to church in, in a very solid Bible-believing church. They prayed for her for years, and God didn't heal her. It took her going to Cambodia and God allowing the people to see her in her brokenness. And then God said, okay, now is the time. Now that the, I wanted, I've saved you for this moment so that these people could see you. Sometimes we don't understand, God, why are you allowing me to be so broken, hurt? And God says, because there's somebody coming that I want to see, that I want them to see my work in you. And you're like, not worth it to me, God. And God says, yes, but it's worth it to me because I love them. I love you too. You are special and I'm going to bring healing to you, but not until they have seen your brokenness so that they can see my glory. We may not get it and I guarantee you it's not fun. But ultimately, God is at work. In this case, it took a long, long time for this young lady. But God was at work. The same Jesus that healed Shannon and lives in Danny, if you are a Christ follower, if you have surrendered your heart to Jesus and invited him in, that same Jesus, Holy Spirit, lives in you. We are, after all, just like those 72 disciples, we are disciples of Jesus. He sent them out and God worked through them. He's now sending you out for God to work through you. 
So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for healing. And then after I pray, those of you who are online, I'll say goodbye. And we'll turn the camera off. And then what we're going to do is, if you believe that God wants to use you to heal somebody, I want you to find somebody that needs healing. If you need healing, uh, let's make it easy and raise your hand. Don't make us guess, okay? <laughs> um, if you need healing, raise your hand. And if you believe God can use you to heal somebody, I want, to, I want you to go and pray for those people. If you want to, take a moment and listen. God, are you saying something here that I need to hear and tell this person? If you're comfortable with using oil, feel free. Okay, if you're not, that's okay. It doesn't have to be used. It's just a tool God uses. If you believe God has done a healing in you, if after somebody prays for you, you say, I'm healed, in whatever respect that is, come talk to me. Okay, we want to worship God and give God glory for what he does. So when you're done praying, or if you don't want to be prayed for, or if you don't want to pray for somebody, if you're just like, I, I'm done, thank you, that was good, you're free to leave after I pray. Um, or you can go at any time after that. And then when it looks like most people are done praying, I'll just, I'll, I'll bless it and excuse everybody, okay? Dismiss, that's what I was looking for. All right. If you're not comfortable with that, you're welcome to stay and just watch. But if you're comfortable either pr being prayed for or praying for people, then let's see what God wants to do today. It may not be anything right now. Or he may be wanting to bring healing in a miraculous and amazing way. But we won't know until we come to him and say, God, what do you want to do here? Okay? So let me pray for us. <coughs> Father, I am, I am both excited and nervous because I... I can't control you. I, I don't have any power over you. You are the God who heals. But God, you're the God who heals. And so God, I come to you and I pray that you would heal, that you would bring healing to our people like your word says you do. I pray, Father, that you would, that you would hand out these gifts of healing to people and that there would be miraculous something that goes on here this morning. God, maybe because you are... Want, you have, you've wanted, waited for this moment. Somebody is, is in need of healing right now. And so, God, I pray that you would bring healing to your people. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. For those of you who are online, may God heal you as well. Blessings upon you. Thank you for being here. All right. If you need healing, I would encourage you, raise your hand. And then if you...